So as a kid around 11 or 12, I had the world on my plate. We have these woods around us that I never ever came close to finding the edge of. I would wake up in the morning early when school was out and my friend Alex and I would spend the whole day mucking around those woods. We would pack sandwiches and sodas, just go nuts, play army and war, cowboys and Indians, you name it. This being the 80s, Alex and I being smart enough kids, my parents had no problem with this and enjoyed taking us to the army surplus store to buy stuff like MREs and survival knives and camping gear. It's pretty regular that would be allowed to stay out overnight if my dad was out there to help us set up camp and close to the property. We daydreamed all kinds of crazy stuff, discovering hidden treasure or uncovering fossils of some unbelievable creature. Maybe we'd find the wreckage of an airplane or strike it rich with gold in one of the dry river beds. The possibilities were endless out there. We made sure to take full advantage of. The honest truth was there really wasn't much of anything out there besides our relentless imagination. One day, after a whole morning of playing, we find a treehouse in the part of the woods we've never been to before. Probably a two hour trek from the edge of the neighborhood, maybe two or three miles at most. It was hilly and rocky. Seriously, a kid's dream. This treehouse was probably 30 feet off the ground, but it looked solid. We're stoked to find a new castle. We hightail it back to get some rope and my pops takes us down to the surplus store. Over dinner, Alex and I just can't shut up about it. The next day comes. We hike out at almost dawn. We get a full backpack of rope and sandwiches and our knives on our hips. The excitement that's so thick we could chew on it. We finally make it out there and we start attaching rungs made of big sticks onto one end of the rope. It took us a good few hours, but we finally got one side finished and the rope tossed over the branch. That's where the little deck and the door are. We finally climb up and are sitting on the deck, looking out, playing rock, paper, scissors for who gets to go in first. Alex wins, goes in and comes right back out. He's white as a sheet, he wants to go home. I'm curious, so I go inside next. This treehouse is probably eight by eight, seven to eight feet high inside. The inside walls are covered, every single inch of naked girls. Not some awesome playboy porn, but kitty porn. I think the oldest kids were about my age. It was Polaroids, glossy magazine pages, stuck perfectly up with staples and filling the entire wall up. When I exited the treehouse, I had a super nauseous feeling. When I looked at Alex, I felt even worse. He was staring at something off in the distance. He looked terrified. I followed his gaze and sure enough, there was a flashlight bobbing through the trees toward our location. My knees gave out. I struggled to get myself over to the ladder, whispering for Alex to follow me. It took a moment, but he snapped out of it and we scrambled down the rope as quickly as we could. As we touched down, the light from the approaching person was reaching through the underbrush and actually now touching me. I couldn't see it through the branches and overgrowth, but the fact that they were so close was panic inducing. I waved for Alex to follow me. We just managed to get out of sight in time. Some guy walked into the clearing, froze in place when he saw our little ladder dangling from the deck above. He knew someone had been inside his freak show treehouse. Exit Alex and I, getting back home as quickly as we could. At first, we ran quietly at least until we were sure that guy wasn't following us. It was like twilight or so when he came upon us. So between brush and the coming darkness, everything kind of worked out in our favor. We informed my dad about it and he called the police. The officer showed up and asked us a few questions like where it was, how did we get up there? Where did we get the rope? Did we take any pictures off the wall? He got increasingly rude about it until my dad put an end to it. He left with our statement and said he would be in touch. We were no longer allowed to take overnights in the woods or be out there for more than an hour without checking in. We actually built a really long tin can phone with permission from my parents, which allowed us a little bit more of our freedom, but we were pretty cut off from deep exploring. After a year or two later, that same cop stopped me when I was hanging out in a different park, saw me smoking and caught me with the joint. Alex asked him whatever happened in that treehouse. 
cop told us not to do drugs and then just left us alone. In college, many, many moons later, Alex sent me an email saying how he read in the big state paper, towns that are, say, the county seat have their own papers, but the capital city has a big paper, that the officer shot himself with his service revolver after his wife found out he was circulating CP. So it comes to my mind, like it came to Alex's, that we found his little CP stash or cave. The creepy part came months later. Alex sent me another email saying that he went to the estate auction. One of the items for sale was a rope ladder with a bag. That's the creepiest story of me out in the woods that I have, folks. It still grosses me out and sends chills down my spine. I was on a road trip for work a couple of years ago, and most of that took me right into the middle of nowhere. One big stretch through New Mexico into Texas, there are lots of little scuzzy towns that I can't recall the names of. There is one incident that happens that goes down as the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. Cut straight to the scene. I'm on day four of the drive, and I'm making pretty good time. On this particular day, though, I'd woken up late, so I got a late start. It's about sundown when I'm running out of gas, getting ready to stop like usual, except I've only actually been driving for six hours when I planned on driving for nine or 10. I hadn't made the progress that I wanted to, so I decided to gas up and push on through the night. Many of these dusty highway towns have 24 hour accommodations, so I really wasn't worried about finding a hotel somewhere. I roll into a gas station maybe 30 minutes later, just before I got the e-message on my dashboard. I park my truck, stretch my legs, and check my phone. As I'm doing this, I notice a guy sitting on the ground near the entrance to the gas station. He looks homeless, but he also looks upset. It's hard to explain. He just had this deep-seated frown on his face. Tried not to look at him and just went about my business. I move some stuff around in the back seat of my truck, double check my belongings, all the regular road trip stuff. I heard a sound behind me. I turn around to find the homeless guy. Here's the thing, he must have been close to seven feet tall. The largest man I've ever seen. Not particularly bulky, just towering with big features. Big hands, big nose, big head. The rest of him was just like dirty and slender. He had some loose belongings, a blanket and an armload of various items. He asked me for a ride in the deepest voice I've ever heard. It was frightening in the sense that I felt truly powerless. This guy was so big, he didn't even seem human to me, and he wanted a favor. How the hell do I say no to that? I don't think that was part of his plan. He just used his size to kind of force the answer that he wanted. I didn't cave, though. I told him I'm sorry. I'm on the clock, and it's a work truck. No passengers allowed, and even said so on the insurance. None of this was true, but it sounded like an official mumbo-jumbo answer figured he'd get me out of any further request. The guy just kind of nodded and then moved out of my way. I apologized again and then said I passed a number of vehicles headed this way. Surely someone will help you out. In my panic to get away from this monster of a man, I just kind of barreled into the convenience store to pay for my gas in person. This seemed like a perfectly logical thing to do, when in reality I was just creating steps so I could be near another person. I got a big bag of jerky, a bottle of soda, and 16 gallons of premium. I asked about the guy outside and the clerk just shrugged, so I went on my merry way. When I got back into my truck, that guy was nowhere to be found, not even in a spot by the door. I put my stuff in my truck and dribbled the gas in the tank, kept an eye out in every direction for that 7 foot tall hitchhiker. I didn't see him, so I pushed on, drove until 9pm, something like that. I was finally tired, and I had put the distance behind me that I so desired. I rolled into some border town, secured a hotel room, and even found a little hole-in-the-wall bar that was still serving dinner. It was a dingy little wannabe Italian spot, built inside a double-wide trailer. It had a low red light, vaguely racist decor on the walls, but was warm and the food smelled amazing coming out of the kitchen. I settled in, ordered a beer, and then just zoned out on my phone. 
By my count, I would still gone over a little 200 miles since I stopped at that gas station. I was right on schedule still. All was well. As I'm going over the map, I hear some incredibly heavy footsteps creak up the stairs and onto the porch of that bar and grill. They make their way to the door which swings open. I see the frame of that homeless guy that was at the station. All I can see is his chest and shoulders because his head is too high for the door frame. He ducks down and creeps his way into the bar, shuts the door behind him. No one really says anything but everyone gives them this lingering look as he strolls over to the bar. I don't really think anything of this at first until I remembered the distance that I just crunched. This guy should be sitting under a flickering fluorescent light some 200 miles behind me, yet here he was like he rode in the passenger seat of my truck. That's when it clicked. I watch as a bartender tells him he can have any table he likes. The guy takes one right in front of me. He's practically staring at me with a grin over the top of my phone. When we had our encounter, I got into the gas station earlier. This guy must have climbed into the bed of my truck. When I exited the gas station, I must have been so spooked that I was keeping an eye out around me not really inspecting my truck at all. He probably just laid down flat that whole damn way, and I had no idea. He gave me a wink, as if to confirm my internal reasoning. There was literally no other logical way that he could be here. I scarfed down the food I ordered, slammed a beer, and left the bar as quickly as possible. The hitchhiker ate a big bowl of spaghetti in true psychotic fashion, just staring me down the whole time. It was a long, sleepless night in my hotel room. I just stared out from behind the blinds, making sure that that creep wasn't sleeping in my truck or stalking me in any way. I didn't see him the rest of the night, but that didn't mean he wasn't around. Who knows, maybe he got a ride with someone else. Maybe he just wanted to mess with me. Either way, I'd never like to meet that seven foot tall phantom ever again. This is going to sound fake, but I promise you it's not. After graduating college, my oldest brother wanted to spend the weekend camping at Lake Berryessa, outside Napa in California. His girlfriend at the time, Shannon, said we could use her godfather's boat, so we hitched it up, headed up to Spanish Flat to dock. The bank of this lake is surrounded by sandy hills and rocky cliff sides in a bowl valley. It's not exactly easy to climb down in some areas. The landscape has a lot of trees. It's a very big lake, so it's possible to not see anyone around after sunset. People typically will tie up their boats and camp out on the banks. We headed towards the southeast corner, found a nice spot. We swam for over an hour or two and then had dinner. I think it must have been around 7 or maybe 8 p.m. because the sun was setting. The lake was still and beautiful. Shannon suggested we climb up the side of the bank find some wood for a campfire. So my brother and I climbed up the side trying to find dried pieces. We were far enough into the woods that we could see the boat and the lights. As we were digging around, we heard this sharp, horrifying and echoing scream. We ran to the tree line to find Shannon, who was on the boat and yelling for us, crying and obviously panicked. We climbed down the side slowly. My brother stopped and stared out onto the lake. There's something floating in the water. I looked out and saw something, slowly drifting along toward the shoreline. My brother walked toward the boat and told Shannon to come stand over by me. Then he walked to the edge of the lake and just stood there quietly. Shannon ran up to me and was crying. I started to walk over to my brother and he said, I think it's a skinned animal. It doesn't have any skin. Just as he finishes that sentence, we hear something else stumbling footsteps through the shoreline. We turn and we can see a person, a man coming straight at us. Shannon screams again and backs up, my brother and I shoulder to shoulder so we can confront this guy together. He points to the thing in the water and starts clapping his hands together. He asks if we like his handiwork, to which we ask if he did that. He says of course, then says we need to help him fish it out. We tell him no thank you, please exit our day camping area, but it's like he didn't even hear us. He just kept wandering up and down the shore, admiring whatever was in the water. 
I stood behind him and I could see it. The water was dark, but I could see some detail. It was floating chest down, and there was this big black garbage bag covering the part of the back. It was too big to be a dog or anything. It didn't have a head, and I couldn't see if it had front legs or not. Whatever it was, it was in fact skinned. It drifted slowly, turning as it moved with the current. We stood there for a few moments, didn't say anything, but I knew we were both thinking the same thing. Please don't let that be a person. Shannon suggested we pack up our chairs and get the hell out of there, so we did just that. Now that this whack job showed up, the only safe place was on the boat. We were literally just tossing our stuff up onto the deck, totally careless of the damage, so we clambered up after it and pushed off from the shore. Our new friend was too far away to stop us. He got to us by the time we had the engine going and backed off 20 feet. As we were backing out, I was driving the boat so I didn't get really a good look, but my brother looked over the edge and tried to get a better description on it. There was blood and other stuff, leaving a pretty steady trail behind it. A cloud so dark, it could have passed for tar. Here's the craziest part. That guy dove in the water and started swimming after us. There's no confusing it. He was barreling right for the side of the boat. There's a small pole ladder in the back, as well as various ropes hanging from the side, so he could climb up if he got close enough. I really started trying to make some space between us, which deterred the guy, who then chose to swim over to the floating partial corpse. Shannon covered her eyes, was freaking out. We headed back to the dock at Spanish Flat. As we tore off for the other side of the lake, my brother looked back and shouted for us to look too. There was this little dinghy piece of shit coming at us from a little further up the channel. It was small, maybe a four-person craft, and the guy driving it looked a lot like the guy that we saw on shore. Mangy, disheveled, just weird in general. He brought his little boat around to where the other guy was, and then after that, we lost line of sight. All the more reason to get the hell out of there. Slowly, one breath at a time, we gathered ourselves to make our report. There is an office there for the park department or something, but nobody was there. We waited for quite a while until a lot attendant showed up, but wasn't really a park ranger. We told him that we had a very serious report to make, left our name and number with him. By this time it was getting dark and we really just wanted to leave. We drove to the closest gas station, left a note and number for the clerk to give to any rangers that stopped in. We got a call the next morning and all went in to file the paperwork. It was a quiet ride home. The rangers were completely blown away by what we told them. They said a few others had called in a boat with the exact same description, but they were nowhere to be found. My brother hasn't brought it up in years, but the last time he did, he said he didn't want to make for a guess about what it was. He got a better look than me, but we didn't go back to that lake for another decade or so after. It still upsets me to think about it today. I'm studying in a different state from where I live. This state is highly crime ridden, with many going unreported and corruption being really high. As you go into the interiors and more rural areas, there is very limited regard for the written law, and it is the law of the land that prevails. Unfortunately, due to the need for land, most of the universities are built in rural areas in the middle of nowhere. My university was no exception. With that background information out of the way, here's my story. I had just gotten done with my end semester exams, and me and my friends had gone out to the city side to celebrate. Unfortunately, we had lost track of time, and we had started to return the journey to campus only at 9.30 p.m., and it was a good two-hour drive. Definitely unsafe to travel at night here. As we're going back via a highway, we hit traffic. So the driver of the cab we took said he would take a shortcut, and we took a turn that went via a desolate road passing a village adjacent to the one my university was in. Horrible decision. Us and another car where that driver probably had a similar idea of a shortcut, made this same turn and went down this road. It was all dark, and apart from a few close shops and huts, it was all wilderness. 
Suddenly, our cab and the other car were stopped by around 10 or more locals who blocked both cars. A few of them came up to us, and they had asked us to pay a toll for that road. This wasn't a rare occurrence. Tolls like this are often charged on such roads. Especially at night, these toll takers become active. These are not official government tolls, but they're charged by locals because they know they have the power. They're illegal all right. It's just an understood custom that such tolls will be paid. These people who stopped us were very clearly drunk and angry. My driver started pleading with them not to take the toll, but they were in no mood to listen. Having been here for two years and interacting with the workers at the university, I could understand the dialect of this region well enough. At one point, the driver's pleas actually made these people angry, and one of them started shouting. At one point, in a fit of rage, he said something to the effect of, If you do not follow the rules, you're not getting out alive. And that's when I saw it. Five men were near our car, and the person who was talking had a gun, and two others had really long knives. All of us knew then that paying the toll wasn't optional anymore, and we all pulled cash from our wallets and then paid the fee, and then got ready to leave. Seeing that gun itself was scary enough, but the truly scary part came a few seconds later. Remember the other car that I talked about? Remember the other car I talked about that was also stopped? Half of the group had come to get the toll from us, while the other half went to the other dude. That car just had one driver. A similar argument must have gone down there. Unfortunately, it seemed like the other dude hadn't complied, and given how drunk the locals were, they were angry and had had enough. They dragged the man out of his car and then started lynching him right there, pelting him with sticks and stones. And then the people near us who had knives then joined in and started taking their turns to stab him. The gun was the only weapon that wasn't used when we were there, as we heard no shots. The man was getting lynched right in front of us, and we were powerless to do anything. Staying there would likely mean that we would suffer the same fate. It felt like we were watching this horrific sight for hours, though in reality, it was only 20 to 30 seconds. Our driver realized what was happening and gunned it out of there. We called the police immediately, but there wasn't a police station anywhere near that village. Our driver then told us what we already knew, that the police would be too late. On top of that, the police being locals themselves often have an understanding with such groups of people and usually just look the other way. We managed to reach university thoroughly shaken up and I nearly pissed myself. We informed our authorities at the university and they said that they would pursue matters further, but we never heard anything. We're all still figuring out how to live with having witnessed what was most likely a murder. I don't mean to offend anyone here, but such crimes are not uncommon. While India is a beautiful place with rich culture and heritage, but like any other country, it has its dark side. And seeing it firsthand, even if it was only for 30 seconds, well, it has scarred me for life. I'm a female and have an Instagram account like many other people. I post pictures on my page here and there, and I always enjoy seeing how many likes and comments that my pictures get. Most of the comments and likes are from my good friends, but of course, not all of them are. Like many other people, I've experienced several creeps online. Sometimes random men will like my pictures, comment on them, or even send me direct messages. They can get kind of creepy, and sometimes I even delete them. For the most part though, I don't really care. It happens here and there and doesn't bother me. I remember though, one time, about a year ago, I posted a picture on Instagram and some guy liked it and commented on it. I read the comment, but didn't bother to click on his profile or anything. I did not know him, but he commented something like, very nice, with a fire emoji. But not long after this, he sent me a direct message as well. He simply said hi to me, but I had no interest in responding. I did click on his page though to see who he was. He looked much older than me, and only had a few pictures. I had no idea who he was, and we didn't have any mutual followers, so I ignored him. I've gotten many direct messages from people who I don't know, and most of the time, I don't respond to them. They usually get the idea and leave me alone after I don't reply. I figured this would be no different, but the man sent me another direct message the next day. This one I also ignored. I didn't even open it. Over the next few days, he sent several more messages to me. 
I didn't bother to read any of them, and I figured eventually the man would give up, but he didn't. Over the next week or so, he sent me messages basically every single day. I would get Instagram notifications several times a day, and at least one of them would be from the man sending me another message. Eventually, I got tired of it and decided to finally block the guy. But before I did, I wanted to read through the messages that he sent me. Right away, I saw that he had sent a photo, and it was my house. I realized that this was no ordinary creep. This man must live in the area, and he somehow knew where I lived. I looked at the other messages that he sent me. He said hi to me over and over again, and then blatantly told me that he knew where I lived. That was followed by a picture of my house, and then him saying hi to me again. I wasn't quite sure what to do. I reported his account to Instagram, and then blocked him. However, I wasn't really confident that anything would be done. I didn't think this was worth going to the police either, because I didn't think that the man had broken any laws. Still, I was now very worried. What was this man capable of? I found myself looking out my front window almost constantly for the rest of the day. I lived by myself in a two-story home near a major US city. For the rest of that day, I did not have to go anywhere and I did my best to stop worrying. I called several of my friends and spoke with them about it. Unfortunately, none of them could come over and keep me company that night because they were either working or had prior plans. I started to feel better when nothing strange happened for a few hours. But then, nighttime came. At around 10 p.m., I was in my living room watching a movie on my TV. By now, my windows were covered with the shades, and I wasn't thinking about the guy as much. My phone hadn't received any strange Instagram notifications either. Part of me had been worried that the man would make another Instagram account and message me again, but that didn't happen. At one point during the movie, I randomly remembered and had the thought to check out the window again. It had been several hours since I had last checked. I turned behind me on the couch and carefully lifted the blinds back. That's when I saw a car parked right out front on the street that I did not recognize. Could that be him? With it being dark out and stuff, obviously I couldn't tell who was driving, but I could tell that there was a person in the driver's seat. I quickly covered the window back up and wondered if the person had seen me. I sat there on the couch for a few moments, thinking of what I should do. Then I heard a car door open and shut. The person was getting out. I carefully moved the window shades again, just barely, just enough to see out. I saw a man walking towards the house through my front yard. This was definitely him. He walked up closer to the house and I heard him moving just outside of my window. I couldn't believe that this was happening. I really hoped that he would not try to break in. I heard him walking further down to behind the house. This time I was calling the police for sure. I took out my phone and dialed. I stayed where I was on the couch and spoke with the police as I waited for them to arrive. During this time, I didn't hear or see anything indicating where the man was. Several minutes later though, I heard a car door open and shut again outside. I was hoping that it was the police arriving and I looked outside, but instead I saw it was the man driving away. I was so glad that he was gone, but I also knew that the police would not be able to catch him right away now. They arrived about five minutes later. I told them about the man leaving and gave the best description of him and the car that I could, but I didn't get a very good look at either. I still didn't feel that confident about him being located. I gave the police the whole story, but I had blocked the account and when I looked at accounts that I had blocked, it must have been deleted because it was gone. After the police left, I was still very worried. I decided that I would stay at one of my friend's houses for the next few days. This was a big help to me because I knew that the man still knew where I lived and he might return. The very next night, I got a direct message request from a random Instagram account. The username was user and then a bunch of random numbers, and it had no profile picture. They sent me just a photograph, and it was of my bedroom window. It was taken from my yard. That must have been what he was doing. I showed the picture to my friend, and we went to the police with it, but I don't know that there was much they could do. The account had no pictures or any information on it. They did say that they would investigate, though. Several days went by without anything happening. I decided that I would return to my house. I drove back there in the morning, but when I got there, I noticed that it had been broken into. The window to the back door had been smashed. I called the police immediately and ran back outside to my car in fear that the man was still inside my house. They arrived very quickly and entered my house. They were inside for a while, but soon they came out with the man. He had been hiding inside of my house. I guess he had broken in the previous night and was waiting for me to return. I'm so glad that he was caught and I will never forget that experience. I'm a typical guy and I have the Instagram app. I go on it basically every day to check out what my friends are doing 
and follow my favorite sports teams and things like that. One thing that I do a lot is go on the explore page. This is just a bunch of random posts from accounts you don't follow, but that might interest you. It's interesting to look at them sometimes, and every new time you log into Instagram though, it's completely different. Now, I don't remember exactly when this started, but I know that I saw the same picture on the explore page twice. This isn't a big deal, but then I saw it a third time. I thought this was pretty strange, but I still didn't click on it. A couple of times later though, I saw it yet again. I truly don't know how many times I saw the picture, but it just kept showing up. Eventually, I caved and I clicked on it, wondering why I kept seeing it. This photo was a picture of a car. It was seemingly random. The car was not particularly new or old, it just looked average. It was a gray four-door sedan. The picture did not have the number of likes listed and didn't have any comments either. I clicked on the page and it was a random word with numbers and the profile picture was one of the cars. The page only had like five followers. On the page were four photos and they were all of different cars. It was like somebody had just walked down the street and took pictures of random parked cars, but none of the cars were really that unique. Two were on the side of the street parked and one was in the driveway and another was in a parking lot. I noticed that one of the cars in the photos was the same make and model that I had. Then I examined the photo a little bit closer. I soon realized that that was my car. I could tell that it was parked in my driveway. This gave me the chills when I saw it. Who ran this account? I shared the picture with a couple of my friends. None of the pictures had any captions or comments on them. My friends agreed that it was really weird, but didn't know who would do that or why. I was really curious, and I thought about commenting or sending a message to the page, but I decided not to. The very next day, I went on Instagram again. This time, I saw the same picture of my car on the explore page. I clicked on it wondering if it was new, but it was in fact the same one. Then I clicked on the profile again, because I saw that they had posted a story. The story was a poll. The poll said, which one? Then there were the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. I did not vote because I didn't understand it at all at the time. I thought this was just really weird and decided to leave it alone. I got off of Instagram and for the rest of the day, I didn't go anywhere. My car sat there in the driveway where it always did. I went to bed that night and got up the next morning to go to work. When I headed out for my car, it was gone. I couldn't believe it. I remembered the posts and everything. I called the police and then my boss. Luckily, my boss didn't mind and she said I could come in a little bit late after I took care of the police report and everything. They took down all of the information that I could give them, including about the strange Instagram page. Unfortunately, when I looked, it had been deleted. The police assured me that they would do what they could to find my vehicle. I took a lift to work and back and was able to get a rental car later that day through insurance. For the next few days, I was thinking about it all the time until finally I got a call that the police had located my vehicle. It was found abandoned, parked on the side of the road, about 20 miles away. Luckily, it had no damage. I was able to get it back, but I don't think the police ever found out who did it. That Instagram page was really bizarre, though. Was the poll a way of deciding which car the person was going to steal? And why would they post these things on Instagram anyways? Either way, I hope nothing like this happens again. My name is Emily, and this happened to me in the spring of 2022. I was living by myself at the time in an apartment, and I worked in the city. I have an Instagram page that has a few thousand followers. I'm not famous by any means, and I'm certainly not an Instagram model, but I do post there pretty frequently. One night, I got a text message from one of my friends. It was a link to an Instagram page, and my friend said, This isn't you, is it? I clicked on the profile and it was an Instagram account claiming to be me, except it wasn't using my name, but a different name. And they had posted quite a few pictures that were all mine. I think the account had about 100 posts and this had been going on for several months. Most of the pictures were pictures that I had already posted on Instagram. They had a decent amount of followers too. I think the account had about 500. I couldn't believe it. Whoever was running this account was just screenshotting my pictures and posting them to their account and they were getting over 100 likes, and nobody seemed to realize that the entire page was a fraud. I looked at some of the comments, and they were just saying things like, wow, you're beautiful. As I scrolled through and looked at more pictures though, I noticed something strange. Some of the pictures of me that they posted were not from my Instagram page. They were pictures that I had of myself, but had never posted. These photos were on my phone, and I don't know how the person had them. The pictures weren't bad or anything, but I just had no clue how they got a hold of them. 
I sent a direct message to the page, asking who they were and why they were stealing my identity. Then I reported the page. Not long after I had sent the message to the page though, they blocked me. I told a few of my friends about it, and they said that they would report the page as well. Within a couple of days, the page ended up getting shut down. I was glad that it was now gone, but I still wondered who had done it. Well, a few days after the page was taken down, I left my apartment one morning. There was a note on my front door. It was folded on a piece of paper and taped to my front door. And when I looked at it, I realized that it was from whoever had been running the Instagram page. The note talked about how this person could get any information from me that they wanted. They also rambled about how I thought I must be so cool because I was popular and some other stuff. When I got this, I went straight to the police. Whoever this was knew where I lived and seemed to be able to hack into some of my accounts. After telling the police all the information that I could, I created new accounts for almost everything that I had and changed all of my passwords. Luckily for me, I moved out of that apartment just a few weeks later because my lease was up. Since that experience, nothing else strange has happened but I still don't know who was doing that. My theory is that it could have possibly been an old high school classmate who didn't like me or something, or it could have been somebody totally random. I really don't know. This is a crazy experience that I had several years ago now. I should mention that I'm a female and I was at a park one day. This was a city park that I was walking through on the way back from work. It's a pretty large area within a large city, so there are usually a lot of people there. As I walked though, at some point, a guy started to follow me throughout the park. I noticed him when I stopped for a moment to look at something and saw him just kind of standing around. Then as I was walking away, he started walking behind me. Soon, I left the park and went onto a city sidewalk. When I was waiting to cross the street and saw him standing there around me, each time that I looked near the guy, it appeared as though he was looking at me as well. To this point though, I didn't know for a fact that he was following me, but I just suspected it. I had to walk about 10 more minutes to get back to my apartment. I checked behind me every so often, and each time that I did, the man was still there following me. This was the first time that something like this had ever happened. When at last I reached my building, he was maybe 20 feet behind me. I quickly went inside and then used my key to enter the building. Then I closed the door behind me and the guy did not enter. I'm not sure if he tried to or if he just kept walking past when I went in. I remembered what he looked like, but I hoped that I would not see him again. Several hours later that night, I got a notification on my phone of a new Instagram follower. When I opened the app, I saw who the follower was. When I noticed his picture, it was the same guy who had been following me around. I had no idea how he knew my name or found my profile. After seeing this, I blocked him. I was really creeped out by how he found me. The very next night, when I was home in my apartment, I got another Instagram notification. The same guy had followed my second profile. I had a second Instagram account where I posted more random things and it was only followed by my closest friends. The account was private but he was requesting to follow me. And this account was so private that I didn't even use my name and I didn't even follow myself with it. I was more freaked out than anything when I saw that he had found it. I blocked him on that profile as well. Only about 30 minutes after this, there was a knock at my door. I walked over and looked through the peephole. The same guy was there. Obviously, he knew where I lived. I didn't know how he knew which unit was mine though. I wasn't going to open the door. He knocked again after about a minute or so. I kept watching him, but he didn't leave. He just kept standing there. I called the police and kept an eye out. The man was just standing there as if he was expecting me to open the door for him. Occasionally, he paced around a little, but he kept returning to right in front of my door. The police got there within about 10 minutes. When they arrived, the man was still there standing outside of my door. I remember that they talked to him, and I heard him claim that he must be at the wrong address. He claimed that he had no clue why anybody would call the cops and he was trying to see his friend Jason. I think the police knew that he was lying. They basically just told him to leave me alone though and not to come back to the apartment building. I talked with officers as well and told them what happened. They said that if he came back to call them again and luckily he didn't. I never saw him again after that night. 
I still can't believe how much of a creep that guy was. This happened to me when I was in college. It was during my second year at my university. I lived in a small house, which I shared with my roommate, Thomas. The university I went to is rather large and I think has about 20,000 total students. This took place sometime during the first semester. I remember that one day I went on Instagram and saw that I had a new follower. I clicked on the profile and it was a girl named Rhonda. She had my school initials in her profile, as well as what I assumed would be her graduating year. She was also followed by two people that I knew from college. None of my really close friends, but some guys that I knew who they were and followed them. I realized that Rhonda must have went to my school and I followed her back. On her profile, she didn't have too many pictures, a few selfies and some pictures of her dog. That was about it. After following her back, I went on with things and didn't think much of it few days went by. Then, one day, I noticed that Rhonda liked all of my pictures on Instagram. Now, I had about 40 posts or so, dating all the way back to my early years of high school. She liked every single photo, and I found that nice, but also a little bit random and odd. I thought that maybe she liked me or something. She didn't comment on anything or send me any messages, though. Now, several more days went by after this. Then one night, Thomas was studying at a classroom and I was at home by myself. There was then a knock on the door. It was probably about nine o'clock at night and I wasn't expecting anybody and had no clue as to who it was. I had been in my room, so I didn't hear the knock very well. I got up and went out into the hallway and then I heard another knock. But I realized then that the knocking was coming from the back door of the house, not even the front door. Now this was really strange. I walked over to the back door and looked out the window. When I did, I saw a girl standing there. It was Rhonda, but at first I didn't recognize her because I had only seen some selfies of her on Instagram. I don't think that I had ever seen her in person before. As I was standing by the door, she tried opening it up. Then I opened up the back door and said hi to her. I then asked her what she was doing here. She asked me if she could come inside. I had a bad feeling about it. Something about her was sort of creeping me out. Maybe it was the fact that she showed up unannounced to my back door at 9 o'clock at night. And by the way, she had no way of knowing where I lived. I asked her how she knew where my house was. She just asked to come inside again. I really didn't want her to. So instead, I told her that I was really busy with homework and I had to get back to it. She just stood there for a moment looking disappointed. Then she said that she was just going to go and walked off sort of angrily. I was glad that she was going, but more confused than anything. After she left, I went back inside and went into my room. Then I blocked Rhonda on Instagram. I felt that she had crossed the line by showing up unannounced like that. When Thomas got back home, I asked him if he knew Rhonda at all. He said no. I showed him her picture and he still didn't recognize her. I told him what happened and he was just as confused as I was. I was hoping that maybe he had known Rhonda and she asked him for the address or something. But the fact that he didn't made it that much more creepy and weird. The very next night, I was pulling a late night session of homework. I had some stuff due at 11.59 p.m. I was trying to get it done at the last moment. It was probably like 11.30 and I was almost done when I heard Thomas call me from the living room. He was in there watching TV and I asked him what he wanted. Then he told me that there was a girl standing at the front door. I knew who it was. I got up and walked out into the living room. I looked out the front door to see Rhonda just standing there, but she didn't knock on the door or anything. She appeared to look over and notice me. Then she turned and ran off. It was the creepiest thing ever. I went back and finished my homework and then joined Thomas watching TV in the living room. We kept glancing out the windows to see if she would come back, but luckily she didn't. After that, I never saw her again. I remember I asked Thomas to look her up on Instagram months later in the school year. She had a few more pictures then and appeared to still attend our university. I still don't know what she was doing. It was really creepy behavior though.
This happened two years ago now. I'm a female and live alone in an apartment building. Like many people, I have an Instagram page that I post on pretty regularly. I would say I post on average at least once a month. I enjoy posting pictures on Instagram, but I know that occasionally you have to deal with a bot or a creepy person. For the most part, I hadn't had any bad experiences until this happened. One day I opened the Instagram app and saw that I had a direct message. It was from one of my followers, a guy named Tim. I didn't know him and I didn't follow him either. I'm not sure how long he had been following me for, but he sent me a message asking if I could come and hang out with him. I found this to be kind of weird and did not respond. I mean, he didn't even have a conversation with me and I didn't know him. He couldn't possibly expect me to just say yes. And based on his profile picture, I wasn't interested in him. I figured that he wouldn't message me again after that. But the next day, he sent me another message. He once more asked me to hang out with him and said that he could pick me up. This time, I responded and said, No thanks, I appreciate the offer though. Now he had to understand that I wasn't interested. Tim then tried to convince me, but I ignored him. I didn't really know why he was sending me these messages seemingly out of nowhere. The next day, I didn't get any more messages from him. I figured that he would stop communicating with me at that point. The following night, I went grocery shopping after work. I would go shopping occasionally here and there whenever I needed to. I didn't have a particular routine or anything. I was inside of the store shopping for about 20 minutes. The time was probably about 8 p.m. or so. After I was done shopping, I headed out to my car in the parking lot. By now, it was mostly quiet, but there were a few people here and there. I got all the way to my vehicle, only to see that there was a car parked next to me. I started to take my groceries out of the cart and put them in my car. That's when the door opened to the car next to me and a guy got out. I did not recognize him. He just seemed like another guy going shopping, but he didn't walk to the store and instead headed straight for me. At first, I was confused, but he then said my name and asked me why I thought I could ignore him. I realized that it was Tim from Instagram and I did recognize him from his picture at that point. I was too confused to say anything though. He said that he was here now and we were together so we may as well hang out. I finally spoke and asked him what he was doing and how he knew I would be here. He claimed that it was a coincidence. I finished putting my groceries in my car and said that I had to get home. I closed my trunk and then tried to walk around him to my driver's door, but he stopped me by grabbing my arm. He told me to come on and go with him. I asked him to let me go and said that he was hurting my arm, but he started to pull me away towards his car. He was a lot stronger than I was, and we started moving towards his vehicle. Then I started yelling as loud as I could. I was yelling help and telling him to let me go. There were luckily a few people that were walking to their cars in the parking lot a ways away. They took notice of what was going on though, and when Tim saw this, he let me go and told me to shut up. I instantly ran around my car for the driver's door and got inside. Tim followed me, but I locked the door before he could get in. I didn't waste any time and I drove out of there. Tim had to run back to his car and I left the parking lot extremely fast. By the time he started his car, I had already left. I went around another nearby store that was out of his sight. Then I took some random residential roads until I was sure he wasn't following me. After that, I drove home. I was so focused on not letting him follow me that I forgot to call the police for a while, but eventually I did. I told them everything that happened, but when I got to my Instagram page, his account was gone. I think he deleted it. Still, after that night, I never saw Tim or heard from him again. I know that kids can be odd sometimes. I was waiting for my bus the other day, and I had my headphones in, looking down the road in the direction where the bus would be coming from. As I turned around, there was this girl who was about eight who was standing right next to me, so I sort of reacted surprised. She just looks at me, not smiling, and says, You're really pretty. So I'm thinking, oh, that's really sweet. Kind of weird, but no harm done. That was until she goes on and says, 
I'm going to rip your face off. I wasn't really sure how to react, so I gave her a weird look, and I'm pretty speechless. I see someone who I assume was her father, standing at the edge of the street, just watching us. The girl sees me staring at the man, so she turns around and starts absolutely screaming her head off at him. <coughs> the man looks at us and then bolts away. She then turns back to me, still not smiling, not crying, not sad, and then runs after the guy. Possibly one of the weirdest experiences I've ever had. Fast forward to earlier today. I'm about two or three suburbs away from the bus stop, and I'm just hanging out in front of my friend's apartment building, having a cigarette while I'm waiting for him to come down. When I see that same little girl walking towards me, she looks at me the whole way until she's in front of me, and then says, I know you. And then I'm like, uh, what? She stares at me for a few minutes, just watching everything I do, following my hands when I move them, and then looking back at my face, staring at my feet, almost as if she was sizing me up. It was completely awkward. I didn't know what to do but to just look back at her. I didn't really want to walk away because I'm not scared of a little kid, and I just can't leave because my friend is coming back down from his apartment. After a few minutes of the standoff, she gives me a weird frown and narrows her eyes, and then says, I'll be back for you. She then slowly shakes her head, like in a, oh I gotcha, kind of way, and then just walks away. I feel like I just encountered the Antichrist. I need to get this out because I've kept it to myself for a really long time and because I want to stress how important it is to listen to your instincts. I'm a female and I was 10 years old at the time this incident took place. My parents were very religious when I was growing up. I didn't have much contact with the outside world other than church or when we went to the store for groceries. I guess you could say I was a sheltered child. I'm only mentioning this part so that you'll understand that up until the occurrence I'm about to explain, I had never truly witnessed some of the evils of this world. My parents and I went to a huge Christmas party that my grandparents held every year. Their house was a spacious two-story Victorian and would always be full of other family members, along with the many friends my grandparents invited. My grandmother would go all out with decorations, and every room had a different Christmassy theme to it. I was pretty introverted, so to amuse myself, I was walking around quietly, observing the decor, when Uncle Andy came up behind me. Well, my my my, look who we have here, he declared loudly, which startled me and had caused me to jump slightly. Turning to face him, I chuckled awkwardly and I gave him a polite greeting. He immediately leered at me with the same sheepish smile he always did. For some context, he was not my immediate uncle. Everyone just called him Uncle Andy. However, he was related to my grandfather in some way. The best description I can give is that he was a tall man with salt and pepper hair, who looking back, reminded me a lot of Jeff Goldblum. But I digress. Uncle Andy began asking me the usual questions. How was school going? What did I want for Christmas? Etc. It was when he suddenly reached out and grabbed a piece of my blonde hair that I froze momentarily. Wow, such long, beautiful hair. He amused, as then brought the strands to his nostrils and gave them a vigorous sniff. Uh, thanks, I muttered as I quickly took a step back. Alarm bells were ringing in my head. Nothing like this had happened to me before, but I knew it was wrong. Adults are not to touch children in this manner. I forced a weak smile as I then explained that I needed to help my mom with something. 
Uncle Andy, who was blocking my path at the time, never once dropped a smirk, as he then said, Very well, but not until you've given me a proper handshake, young lady. I swallowed hard, and I'm sure my eyes widened in response. Even so, I figured it was the only option to get him to move. Fine, I replied as I held out my hand. He locked my hand tightly with his, and he gave it a shake. I began to tug away, but not before he stroked the back of my hand with his thumb, all while maintaining really strong eye contact with me. He finally let go and stated, See you around. I darted past him, frantically looking everywhere for my mom. After finding her in the kitchen, I told her that I needed to tell her something important, but she was in the middle of cooking three different things at once. Tons of the other relatives littered the small space and were talking loudly, so it was hard for her to hear what I was saying. She instructed me to go find my dad, and I went to do just that. As I exited the kitchen, to my horror, there was Uncle Andy again in the hallway. A perverse grin was still plastered on his face. I bolted into the dining room, which to my relief is right where my dad and grandpa were at the table. I scooted onto the bench next to my dad for safety. They were having a conversation, and I knew better to interrupt, but I was just happy to be safe for the moment. Throughout the rest of the evening, I made sure to never leave my mom or dad's side. Even still, no matter where I went, Uncle Andy's sight bore right into me. His gaze was predatory. I felt dirty, vulnerable, and like his targeted prey. After that night, every year, I would always make up a new excuse why I didn't feel like going to Christmas parties. Luckily, the few times I couldn't get out of it, Uncle Andy and his family didn't show up. Fast forward to roughly 15 years later, I was chatting with my half-sister on the phone, who always lived in the same town as my grandparents. She opened up to me about the abuse she had gone through in her childhood at the hand of her stepfather. Somehow that led to me telling her all about my experience with Uncle Andy. She gasped and went quiet for a moment, before then telling me that Uncle Andy was arrested earlier that year for lewd child abuse. Apparently he had been abusing his own children for years, but had kept them quiet about it with manipulation tactics. It wasn't until he was caught in the act of sexually abusing his grandchild that his perverted and sick ways finally came to light. My throat felt like it dropped into my stomach. I was floored to say the least. This meant that my intuition had been right. Something was majorly off with Uncle Andy. Even as a sheltered child, I could sense it despite having never been told in depth what sexual abuse was back then. I shared this story to warn you all. If you ever find yourself in a situation where your gun instinct is on high alert, please listen to it. If something just feels off about someone, chances are it's true. Be safe, and don't take the risk of playing it off as nothing. I know that this story may not seem that frightening to some, but I'm thankful every day that I listened to that inner voice that protected me. If I hadn't, I may have very well been one of Uncle Andy's victims if he had ever had the chance to get me alone long enough. Today I took my five-year-old son and my three-month-old daughter to the playground. We were there to meet a friend of mine and her daughter. It's got regular playground equipment, a huge parking lot, and a big grassy area surrounded by trees. On the other side of the trees is some sort of development they're working on. This area is pretty isolated. It's just a bunch of twisty roads and random buildings. I've never thought about or noticed this until today. We get to the park and meet up with my friend. Another mom that we knew was there with her two girls as well. The only other people there was a dad with his little girl and boy. I looked to be somewhere between 10 to 12. So the moms are there sitting, chatting, and playing with my adorable daughter, having a good time. The older kids were playing together, and everything was fine. Eventually, all the kids from our group kind of wander off on the playground and do their own thing. The seesaws are in a shady area. Next to them is a big stretch of grass, then the trees with a development area behind them. 
My son wants to go on the seesaw, but nobody wanted to join him. I get up to go, and the ten-year-old boy who is not a part of our group comes up to me and says, Hi, do you want me to play with your son? Which was a bit strange that he asked me and not my son. But I said, Uh, sure, bud. You go right ahead. So he goes to the other side and starts seesawing with him. His demeanor was so strange. This boy didn't smile. His voice was flat. And he didn't say a word to my son. My son was oblivious and was chatting away. After a few minutes, I start walking back to my bench and I hear the other boy start talking with my son. Okay, so maybe he's shy around grown-ups. I sit down and start talking with my friends. The father of the boy walks near us to probably go up to his car and I say, Hey, it was really sweet of your son to go offer to play with mine. And I smile at him. He looks at me and goes, That boy is not my son. I don't know who he is. He walked over and asked if I wanted him to play with my daughter. And he just kind of followed us around until you guys got here. <laughs> Weird, right? He shook his head and walked away. I got this very uneasy feeling in my stomach. And I walked over to the seesaws. They were gone. I run back and hand my daughter to my friend, and then took off yelling my son's name. I see them walking towards the trees. I would guess they were a football field or so away from the area. I got this awful feeling, and I ran as fast as I could, yelling my son's name. He turned around and started trying to walk toward me. The boy grabs my son's arm and pulls him towards the trees. He then gets upset and starts yelling, Hey, let go of me! Now something that you should know about my son is that he has ADHD, and he does not like to be grabbed, pushed, or pulled. So when he gets frustrated, it usually comes out in very aggressive ways. In the moment I was thankful for this, he begins punching the boy and headbutting him like a crazy person. The boy lets go. And as I get to them, he disappears into the trees. My friends finally realize something was going on, so they're now standing at the edge of the play area, looking baffled. My son is crying. I'm shaking. I have no idea what the f just happened. I asked my son where he was going, and he said that his friend wanted to take him to go see Ryan. He was referring to the guy from Ryan Toy Reviews, his favorite YouTube channel, which he talks about nonstop. He told the boy about Ryan, and apparently the boy claimed that he knew where Ryan lived, then asked my son if he wanted to go visit him and play. So of course my son, not knowing any better, said yes. I have no idea what this kid's intentions were. I don't understand why he would lie to my son like that and why he wanted to take him into the woods. Maybe this was completely innocent. But deep down, I know it wasn't. This is a memory I've tried to block out. But the other day when my siblings and I were talking about the funny stuff my dad did when he was alive, and how sometimes he would be humorlessly absent-minded as a parent, and this long-forgotten memory came back to me, and I can't stop thinking about it. When I was about four, I had a playground fall that resulted in a serious cut in the back of my head that needed stitches. A few weeks later, my dad took me back to the doctors to have them removed. I was very brave and sat very still for the doctor, unlike the huge fuss I had made when they put them in. So as a reward, my dad got me an ice cream and took me to the beach. It was a very small Australian town, and the beach was quite secluded. Even though it was the middle of the summer, there was only a handful of slightly older children swimming, mind you, without their parents. 
My dad walked me down to the water's edge and sternly warned me to stay in the shallow water and to not go any deeper than my knees. Then he disappeared. I imagine he was using the public restroom or something. I know that sounds bad, but he really wasn't a bad father. As I mentioned before, he could just be a bit irresponsible and absent-minded sometimes, but he always meant well. It drove my mom insane. There was an older boy, about 10 years old. He was paddling around a few meters away, but slowly came in closer. He then called out to me. I remembered he had blonde hair and was smiling brightly. He asked me what my name and age was. I answered, also telling him about all the important details about my trip to the doctors that morning, emphasizing that I had been a very brave kid to impress him. My story seemed to amuse him, and he asked why I didn't come out and swim a bit deeper. I explained that I wasn't allowed to go in past my knees until my dad got back, because I couldn't swim very well, and I didn't want to get into trouble. He assured me that I couldn't possibly get into trouble if he was teaching me how to swim, and besides, my dad wouldn't see because he was gone. When I was still hesitant, he added, Are you afraid? I thought you were brave. So I followed him out until my feet couldn't touch the bottom. He immediately grabbed me and held me under the water. I'm getting angry and upset just thinking about it. I struggled, but he was more than twice my age and my size. I realized now that he had separated from the other group of kids so they wouldn't know what he was up to. Drowning an unattended child is the perfect crime because you could easily pass it off as an accident. Probably only seconds before I lost consciousness, the boy abruptly let go and my dad lifted me out of the water. I could see the look of bewilderment mixed with fear and rage on his face. Then for what seemed like a very long time, he patted me on my back while I screamed, sobbed, and coughed over his shoulder. By the time I had settled, and my father was satisfied that I was okay, the blonde boy and the other kids were gone. Although my dad still went driving around looking for them. Had that kid stuck around, I'm quite certain my dad would have killed him. Shortly after this, we moved towns. I don't think he ever went to the police, but I can't be certain. All I know is that he never told my mom about it, because she would have lost her shit at him for leaving me by myself. I really do feel that kid seriously meant to kill me. There was something malicious about the way he tightened his hold when I struggled. I felt like he was determined and not messing around. I want to start off by saying that I'm very open about my past, and I have an amazing support network. I chose to share my story on YouTube to help out others get through similar situations. Nobody should have to feel like they're going through trauma alone. The first eight years of my life are almost completely blocked off by the events of one night. Even 20 years later, I still remember what happened like it was yesterday. My father was a very angry man. He would verbally abuse my mom, older sister, and myself, and occasionally becoming physical with us. One day I was sitting in his chair while watching cartoons, and he grabbed a wooden spoon from the kitchen, and he hit me across the head with it, and the spoon broke. He had actually hit me that hard. He came from a very twisted and evil family. My mom was the complete opposite. I don't remember much of her, but I remember feeling an overwhelming sense of safety and love. During this time, we lived in a country town in Australia on the outskirts of the town. In early 2002, three days after I turned eight, I had a nightmare during the night. I woke up and I'd walk through the house to my parents' room. I woke up my mom and I told her that I had a nightmare. We then went into the living room and she made the couch for me. 
We fell asleep almost right away. I don't know what time it was, but I'd woke up to the sound of banging, like someone was hammering a nail into the next room. I then felt a splash of something hit my cheek. I then wiped it away as I was waking up. To my horror, I then saw my father standing over my mom, wielding a bloody hammer, and I then looked to where my mom was laying. There was a bloodied mess from where her head was on the pillow, and this will be forever etched into my mind. I froze and I tried to scream, but I made no sound. I then looked at my hand and I saw that it was blood that hit my face. Then my father covered my mom's head with a pillow to try and hide what he did. I then ran to my sister's room that was across the house. When I got to her room, I tried to tell her what happened, but again, I made no sound. My mind was going a million miles an hour at this point. I remember hearing what I wanted to say in my head, and I was really confused why my sister wasn't panicking. She followed me to where our parents were. My father dropped the hammer and was now calling the police on himself when we ran into the room. My sister was screaming at the top of her lungs when she saw my mom laying there. We could still hear my mom trying to breathe, and I will always remember that sound. My father called the police three times to tell them what he did and give them the directions to our house. He also ushered us out of the room to the other side of the house, away from our mom. He caused all this suffering because my mom said she wanted to take both my sister and I and then get away from him. My mom did get us away from him. Unfortunately, however, she paid the ultimate price to do so. He served 12 years in prison for what he did. From the letters he sent us, it was hell for him. One incident that stands out to me was he had used the prison swimming pool when he shouldn't have. Some high-profile criminal was using it, and when he returned to his cell, his bed was on fire. Hearing that, part of me really wished he was in bed when it went up in flames. During late 2011, I was diagnosed with cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and near the mid of 2012, I beat it. Near the end of his prison sentence, my father developed skin cancer, and he got most of it removed. Well, a few years later, it came back and there was a really high chance that he wouldn't survive it. He died in 2014 in the presence of his twisted family. When I found this out, I had felt a huge weight lift right off of me, and I thought it was almost poetic that I beat cancer, but he didn't. Due to the event happening so close to my birthday, I've always really hated celebrating it. I used to really pretend enjoying it when family and friends decided to do something for me during the first few years after this all happened. But later on, I just chose not to do anything. All of my friends and family have always been really supportive over the years, and I've been in therapy for years and dealing with anxiety, depression, and PTSD for the past 10 years. I'm unable to work or have a love life due to very low self-esteem. I was lucky that I found Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at the age of 13 because it hasn't only been a great way to let out my anger and frustration in a controlled environment, but also my coaches have all taught me how to remain calm when I'm not on the mat. To my cold-blooded father that stole my mother from me, I honestly hope that you're in the deepest, darkest pit in hell. Hopefully this is okay to post here. My story is not one where I was the target of someone stalking or harassment, but one where I was the guy who was at the right place at the right time, and I'm fairly certain that my inadvertent intervention may have saved someone I'd never met. Well, who knows what. This was back in 2015 or 16. I'm a career tow truck driver. At this point, I've been towing cars for most of my adult life, and will most likely do so until I retire or die, whichever comes first. At the time, I was working for a pretty small towing company with only two employees. We rotated who was on call each weekend. It was my weekend on call. It was summer. So with people being out and about late and whatnot, I was pretty busy. Cleaning up accidents, towing broken cars down both in the city and off the highway. I was fine with it, as I was paid in commission at the time. So the more calls I did, the more money I made. It's Saturday night, now Sunday morning. It's around 2.30 to 3. Like I said, I've been busy. I'm tired, I'm a little grumpy, and I kind of want to go home when my phone rings. It's an insurance company calling asking if we could do a tow for one of their customers who's broken down on the side of the highway. 
The breakdown location they gave me is about 15 miles out of town, which I normally wouldn't do, but the tow destination happens to be a dealership that's a couple of minutes from my apartment. So I contemplate rejecting the call, but because I'm paid commission, I figure screw it. I can run up, grab this car, drop it off the corner from my place, then hopefully I can just head home and get a couple hours of shut eye. So I take the call and hop onto the highway. The insurance company provided me with the customer's first name which for privacy's sake we'll call her Kara, and then gave me a phone number for her. I usually try to make contact with the people who are on the side of the highway to let them know that I'm on my way, and give them an ETA. I tried calling her a couple of times, but she didn't answer. Not unusual. After a short while, I see hazard lights up on the way on the shoulder, so I turn on my strobes and start slowing down. As I approach, I notice that not only is there a late model car that I'm looking for, but there's another car on the scene as well that doesn't have its hazards on, but it's parked in front of the car I'm meant to tow. This is annoying but not uncommon, as I needed to be able to get in front of the disabled car in order to load it and sometimes people don't realize that, but because the other car is there, I instead pull up behind both cars. Standing at the trunk of the late model car, which is now directly in front of me, are a man and a woman. The woman is probably in her early 20s, dressed to the nines for a night out. She's maybe 5'1 or 5'2. She's wearing tight leatherish or something pants, a halter top, long black hair, very pretty. The man is probably 5'10 and skinny, maybe 150 or 160 pounds, wearing a dark hoodie and dirty jeans. They're standing very close, facing each other. She has her arms crossed and he's leaning down talking to her. I step out of my truck and approach them both, and I introduce myself. They separate a few feet, and I look to the woman and say, Are you Kara? She nods. I say that I'm here from her insurance company, and ask what's going on with her car. Immediately, the man pipes up and says, Yeah, it's just some fuel issues. It's an easy fix. Can you just drop it off at this commuter parking lot? I'm going to fix it for her there. I'm rather annoyed at this, because the commuter lot in question is further up the highway. I'm already 15 miles out of town. Like I said before, I only took this call because it was supposed to be coming back toward my apartment. And I really wanted to go home. Not only that, but in order to change the original tow destination, I would have to call the insurance company back, wait on hold for them for who knows how long for a representative, and then let them know of the change and try to get them to pay me extra for the deadhead miles back home after I unload. I really didn't want to do any of this. Thirdly, this is a late model car. I'm no mechanic, but it's new enough that whatever is wrong with it is likely covered under warranty, so the dealership is really the best place for it to go anyways. I explain all this to this guy, but he's not really having it. He gets stern with me, saying something like, Look man, you just need to take the car where I tell you to take it. We go back and forth on this for maybe 60 seconds, and he's just getting madder and madder. Well you know what man? You're not the name insured, Kara is. The easy way to settle this is to ask what she wants me to do with the car. Whatever she says is what I'll do. Fingers crossed she'll want to take it to the dealership so I can get home sooner. I turn to look at Kara to ask her that question. I don't see her right away. She's no longer standing where she was a minute ago, which was slightly off to my right. I continue not to see her until I've turned almost all the way around because she's standing directly behind me. And by directly, I mean within an inch of my back, arms still crossed. I look down at her, and she locks eyes with me. Her eyes are wide as plates, almost owl-like. Immediately, it feels like she's staring into my soul. She didn't have to say a word, and she didn't have to. I took a step back and did what I felt was like a double-double take. I looked at him, then at her, then at him again, then back at her. It slowly starts to dawn on me that maybe something isn't quite right. I ask her, do you know this guy? And she ever so slightly shook her head no. The expression on her face when I asked her that will forever be burned into my skull. Turned to the guy and was like, oh, you gotta go, man. Now I'm not a tough guy. I'm a total beta male, if there is such a thing. And I don't care who knows it. I've got nothing to prove. I'm super adverse to confrontation and will run at the first sight of trouble. I'm not exactly the biggest of guys either. I am, however, what I'd like to call sturdy. 
I'm 5'8 and 240 pounds and have a bit of a gut. I also have big thighs and broad shoulders and people generally surprised to find out that I weigh as much as I do. And I think that might have been my saving grace for what happened next. Without a word, the guy starts to move for Kara and I move to stay in between him. He tries to push me out of his way by shoving me in the chest. But, because I believe he underestimated my weight, only pushed me hard enough to make me take a single step back. Immediately, I took that step forward toward him and body check him. Hard. As hard as I could. Hard enough to completely knock him over, basically onto his ass. Because we rotated during the back and forth push bit, Kara is now in front of me to my right. Somewhat between me and the guy who's trying to scramble to his feet. I reached out and snatched up the poor girl by her waist, spun her toward my truck, and yelled for her to get into the driver's side, and she does so. I turn back to the guy, who's standing up again at this point, and he's breathing hard. He gets right up in my face but doesn't do anything, just breathes at me. I stare him right in the face, mustering up the best dad voice I can muster and just say, You need to go. I'm shaking now absolutely terrified. I don't know if he has a weapon. Don't know if he's going to try to fight me. I don't know what I would do if he did. Like I said before, I'm not a tough guy. I don't even know how to fight. I've never been in a fight in my life. What if I get badly hurt? What if I get stabbed? What do I even do now? I just want to go home. I wasn't even going to take this damn call. All this is running through my head at lightning speed. After probably around 15 seconds or so, which felt like eons. He huffs a bit, smiles one of the creepiest smiles I've ever seen, and starts to back up, sucking his teeth and rubbing his hands together. He slowly starts walking backward a few steps, then makes his way to the front of the car, gets in and drives off. I stayed motionless, watching him until I could no longer see his taillights. I got Kara's car loaded up onto the tow truck as we made our way to the dealership, she told me through tears that her car had shut off while she was driving. She pulled over to the shoulder, called her parents because she was on their insurance. Her parents made the call to the insurance company, who eventually dispatched me to her location. While she was waiting, a bit after she made the call, the guy pulled up in front of her, walked up to her passenger side window, and tried to talk to her, ask if she needed help. She told him she was fine and that a tow truck was coming, and she didn't need any help. He persisted, and she tried to tell him off, eventually tried to roll up the window. Apparently he stuck his arm in the window and got the door unlocked, and opened up the door. In fear, she jumped out of the car, and ran to the back of her car, and stayed put there, because it was in the line of sight of traffic. Apparently he was pretty lewd with her, whenever she tried to go back to her car, he would prevent her from getting inside. Several minutes later I showed up. Who knows what would have happened had the timing been any different. Her parents were waiting at the dealership when we arrived. She told them what had just happened. Her parents gave me a $20 tip, which was all the cash they had on them at the time. And Kara gave me a very tight and clearly heartfelt hug before I left. I never saw her again. I tell you what, every guy has daydreamed at some point of coming to the rescue of a pretty girl in trouble, myself included. You think you're going to be a hero, that you're going to be the cat's ass, you're going to slay the dragon and get the girl and ride off into the sunset, like the king you think you are. But for me, being in that situation, in the moment, was one of the most terrible feelings I've ever had in my entire life. Forced into a confrontation I didn't want, nor was I prepared for. Not knowing what to expect from a clearly not well hinged individual, I didn't feel like the cat's ass. I didn't feel like a hero. I felt like a scared little kid encountering a bully on the playground for the first time. If I'm ever in a situation like that again, I will never not intervene, but I really just hope I don't have to. Thanks again for reading. Back when I was 18 years old, for about six months my boss drove me to work. I know that may sound a little weird, but I didn't get a license yet and he knew my mom. It also helped that he lived about two minutes from my house. It was just a weird situation and no matter how I try to preface it, I just know that it sounds weird. Most mornings the drive to work was uneventful. We'd usually get to work at around 6.30am and neither one of us would talk in the car. 
He was usually hung over and I just wasn't the talkative type. I'm a quiet person by nature, but I was even quieter back then. One day, we had to go to work at 3 in the morning for inventory. My boss decided it would be good to show me, so I got up extra early for that 3 a.m. shift. On the way into work that morning, my boss said that he wanted to grab some coffee at the gas station since it was the only place that was open. When we parked, as he was getting out of the car, he told me that he was going to hit the restroom as well. I just nodded and decided to wait in the car. I was exhausted from staying up way too late playing video games and I was planning on just resting my eyes until we got to work. I'm assuming a few minutes had passed, I don't know exactly how long it was because I was falling asleep while I was waiting for my boss. With no notice, the back seat door opened and it startled me in my half-asleep state. I just thought it was my boss and then I felt movement behind me. I finally looked behind me and just sitting there in the back seat was a woman. She didn't appear to be homeless or look like she was on anything, she just looked strange. And we made eye contact for a few seconds and then I went back around trying to process what was happening. I'm a really quiet person and I was even more quiet back then like I said and I didn't know what to say or what to do. I was just hoping my boss was going to come back out soon. I started to finally work up the courage to ask what was going on and I was immediately freaked out when I turned around. She was sitting there, now smiling but looking forward. I don't really know how to describe her eyes. They were cold and dark and seemed almost lifeless even though she was kind of pretty. Even as I write this, I still can't get the image of her out of my mind. It had probably been about 30 seconds since all this started and I finally uttered my words when I asked her, Hey, is everything okay? You know this isn't your car, right? Instead of answering with words, she just started to scream erratically. It was so erratic that it was shaking the entire car it felt like, or maybe just my head. I jumped back just out of panic, confusion and shock and I saw my boss walking out of the gas station. I just dove out of the passenger side door and shut it behind me. My boss was confused and asked me what the heck was going on and I just pointed to the woman in the back seat of his car. We both just stood there almost in amazement and disbelief. She was still screaming, shaking and rocking back and forth. We could physically see the car shaking from her wild movements from inside the car. My boss approached the back seat where she was sitting and as he grabbed the door handle, she put both her hands on the window and I kid you not, started to hiss and growl at my boss. He said, nope, and walked back towards me. I was standing probably 10 feet away at this point. He immediately called the police and we were hoping that they would arrive soon since it was a small town. The entire time that we were waiting for the cops we could hear the woman screaming and the car still shaking. After a minute or two of waiting for the police we went inside and watched her from inside the gas station. There was just something unsettling about the entire situation. She wasn't trying to rob us. She only looked like she wanted to cause harm when we got near the car. I mean, she was sitting in the back seat, so she wasn't even trying to steal the car. It was just all so weird. The cops showed up maybe five minutes after the call. We went outside to greet the officer and fill him in on the situation, and he looked confused, and I'm not going to lie, he almost looked kind of amused by the whole situation. The officer tried to get the woman to come out calmly, but after a minute of her screaming and growling, he basically went into the car and apprehended her. And this is where this bad dream truly turned into a nightmare. Upon arrest, the officer had to remove four knives from her person. Yeah, you heard that right. This woman had four sharp objects on her. Thankfully, she never showed us the knives or even hinted at the fact that she had them, but even more disturbing perhaps is the fact that she didn't have an ID on her and she wasn't talking, so the officer had no idea who she was. This complete stranger came out of nowhere. She got into my boss's car without saying a word. She went from smiling to off the wall insane. Then, to cap things off, she had no ID and four deadly weapons on her. 
I've had some wild things happen to me over the years, but I'd have to say that this was probably the strangest and most terrifying that's ever happened to me. It's been years, and I remember this moment like it was yesterday. I'll never forget that woman's face, and I honestly wonder what she's up to now. When I was in college, I attended film school, and let me tell you, I loved it. What a great experience. I met so many awesome people and learned so much, and I always loved it when we had a chance to create a short film, a chance to be able to tell stories with your unique vision. For me, I had a really hard time brainstorming and coming up with ideas while I was physically at the school. I couldn't concentrate in the dorms and the library and places like that just didn't give the creative vibe. So, I started going on these long night drives whenever I needed to brainstorm. I'd throw on some tunes and just drive around letting my mind go to all sorts of wild places. On one of these night drives, I started to see flashing lights in my rearview mirror. When I looked back, the lights were getting closer and it was clear that I was getting pulled over for something. I pulled over and noticed that the car pulled over behind me. The lights went off and I just sat there for a minute or two contemplating what I could have done possibly to get pulled over like this. I took the key out of the car and set it on my dashboard. I don't know if that's like a universal thing, but I was always told when you get pulled over, put the key there. I started to look in the mirror, trying to make out any details that I could, but it was just too dark. From what I could tell, it looked like a pickup truck, but I couldn't be 100% certain. I started to have my doubts that this was even a real cop. I had just never seen a pickup truck cop car. And I started thinking that it could have been an undercover cop, but I still kept going to that same point, which was, what did I do? Finally, someone emerged from the vehicle. It was dark, but I could clearly see that this person was wearing black pants and a black hooded sweatshirt. Full alarm bells were going off because I was sure that I had never seen a cop with a hoodie on, but it didn't speed away because I still had that fear of, what if this was a cop? I would be fleeing the police and they would have my license plate and it was a whole mental battle that I was having. He looked like wobbling all over the place as he was walking towards my car and when he got to my window, which was rolled down about a quarter of the way, I could see most of his face even through the hood as it was firmly on. He starts shouting from outside the window, step out of the vehicle now. I could immediately smell the booze reeking out of his breath towards my face through the little crack in the window, and I know I'm stupid but it took me this long to finally be sure that this wasn't a real cop, and I just yelled through the window, no, grabbed my keys, and tried to start my car. While I was struggling to find the keyhole, the man shouted again that I said get out right now. He then lifted part of his sweatshirt and started to pull something out that looked like a firearm, but... I couldn't be sure. I just ducked down, put the car into gear and drove off as fast as I could. I couldn't enjoy any relief in that moment though, because within seconds, I now saw him following me. He didn't turn on the flashing lights but got close enough to my car that he was straight up tailgating. If I switched lanes, he switched lanes. The speed limit on these dark roads was 45 miles per hour and I was driving over 65 miles per hour trying to lose this guy. Before I knew it, I was almost 30 minutes away from campus and this guy was still directly on my tail. I then did something that I had seen a million times in movies and I couldn't believe that it actually worked. I was closing in on an on-ramp for the highway. I waited until the last possible second and then swerved over and got onto the highway, forcing him to miss the ramp or he may have crashed. About two minutes passed and I saw no lights behind me. I hoped that I had finally lost this madman. Instead of getting off at the next exit, which I had a feeling that he may have thought was my plan, I made an illegal U-turn on the highway and got to the other side. I made the short drive back and got off the exit that I got on. I had no idea where I was. I drove around slowly for a while until I found a 24-hour gas station and I go inside and told this guy what had happened and basically just begged him to call the police in that moment, which thankfully he did. I also had to ask him for directions back to the school. Now this was before everyone had cell phones all the time so I couldn't just GPS my way back. I had a brick phone that I usually just kept in my dorm. 
and when the cops showed up, I gave them all the information I could, which honestly wasn't that much since it was so dark. I mean, how many people own a pickup truck and a hoodie? Probably millions. The cop was honest and told me that they most likely would never find out who the man was since I didn't get any plate information. He was super nice though and escorted me back to the school just in case that man resurfaced. I think about that night a lot and just how crazy it was and how stupid I was. I wanted to punch the past version of myself for pulling over and not reacting faster. Whenever I have a truck tailgating me at night now, I'm always reminded of that night and I just hope that all these years later that that truck man never returns. When I was younger, each summer and almost every new year, my family would pack the car and go on a road trip to visit family in Mexico. We never had any problems until one particular trip when I was eight. Like every road trip before, we left our home in North Texas around 6 p.m. in order to reach our destination the following morning. So around 2 a.m., we crossed into Mexico. And that's when things got weird. When you're on an only stretch of freeway in the middle of the desert, you don't tend to freak out about having the same car behind you for miles. It was practically pitch black on the outside of our car windows, the only visible shapes being the dotted stars and the eerie silhouettes of the cacti. We'd been in Mexico for an hour and a half, still had a few more hours to drive, and I remember sleeping but not being semi-conscious of what was around me, because I didn't have the skill to really fall asleep in a car. So when my mother suddenly spoke my dad's name, I heard her. Miguel, that car behind us, it's been behind us since we left Laredo. My dad peeked at the car and shrugged off my mom's tension. A lot of cars use this road. He's probably going to Reynosa or another city and left it at that. Despite his sureness, my mom kept a weary eye on that car behind us. By this time, my siblings and I were hyper aware of the car and entertained ourselves with watching it through the gaps in the luggage that blocked the rear window. We got tired pretty quickly. He's getting closer, my mother noted. We turned to watch as the car inch closer and closer to ours. He's too close, Miguel. She was right. By this time, the car was practically pressed against the rear of our car. And on a lowly stretch of the highway in the middle of nowhere, with another few hours until daylight, it was downright scary. We couldn't do much. My dad didn't slow down, didn't stop, and he didn't speed away either. He just drove. And that car followed. The next 30 minutes were the most tense we had ever experienced. The car would ease off sometimes, only to press its blinding headlights against our rear once more. Like he knew he was freaking us out and enjoyed it. It was during one of the periods that the car had pulled away that my mom spotted a police car up ahead, parked on the side of the road, and she didn't miss a beat. Pull over, right in front of the police. Pull over right now, Miguel. And he did. And that car kept driving. I wonder how confused the policeman must have been as he watched my dad park her car right in front of him. The policeman came over and asked what was wrong. My mother urgently told him everything. The car, the way it followed us and taunted us. The policeman took her claim seriously and told us how people were victimized and had their car stolen on these empty highways by thugs and criminals. Then he offered to drive behind us for a while to make us feel safer. We drove off with that police cruiser behind us, relieved. Until about 10 minutes later, when we saw something that confirmed the policeman's words and my mother's worst fears. We saw that car pulled over, onto the side of the road, waiting. This happened in 2019. I was in my second year of college. At the time, I lived with two other girls in a town home, but they were back at their parents' house for the holidays. I work in healthcare and would be working Christmas that year. A bit of backstory, there used to be four of us living there, but one of our roommates had to move out due to issues with her boyfriend. He suffered from a condition called jackass. He was supposed to come every so often, but basically ended up living there. We told her that she had to kick him out after an incident where he got physical with her and verbally abusive with the rest of us. She wouldn't listen, and we told her that she would have to talk to the landlord. 
Long story short, she ended up moving out and left on bad terms with us. On another side note, I've also been in an abusive relationship, so I understand how things might have been for her. I tried my best for two years at that point to help her open her eyes and get her away from him, but you know how it goes. The entire situation was affecting everyone that lived there, and we didn't feel safe with him around, so she had to move out. It was Christmas Eve, and I had to work the next day, so I was getting ready for bed. I locked the doors, turned off all the lights, and went downstairs to the basement where my bedroom was. I was scrolling on my phone for about an hour. It was Christmas Day at this point. That's when I heard what sounded like chairs in the kitchen being moved. The kitchen is right above my bedroom. I thought maybe I was hearing the neighbors next door as we share the same walls, and sometimes they can be loud. But I remember one of them texting me and asking me to bring in a package they were expecting since they were gone. The noise was brief, so I just brushed it off. The next thing I knew, my bedroom door is being creaked open. In this moment, I get a flashback and remembered my second grade teacher telling us about the time someone had broken to her house and she acted as if she was sleeping. So if they were just there to rob her, they wouldn't feel the need to hurt her. But my phone screen was lighting up my scared, jaw-dropped face, so I was unable to put on that facade. My bed faces directly to the door, so we're just looking right at each other. I was shitting myself while the intruder had one foot in my bedroom, with the door cracked open. It felt like an eternity, but in reality it was probably only about 10 seconds. We were just staring at each other. He slowly closes my door. I just sit there in complete and utter shock. I could not make out what he looked like, as my eyes were still adjusting to the dark. All I could see was a backward baseball cap. I knew that I had to call the police, but my anxious ass knew that if I called, it would alert my parents. It was part of our phone plan. Me being dumb as hell, didn't want to worry them. I was also scared that he might still be in the house, and I didn't know what he would do if he heard me call. So I texted my boyfriend. Some random guy just broke into my house and came into my room. He immediately snapped me out of it and texted back. Call the police. The dispatcher asked me if I felt comfortable to go unlock the front door for them so they wouldn't have to break it down. I told her no way. I don't care if the door is broken. I'm not going up there alone. A couple minutes later I see flashlights shining through my window. I hear the police knocking at the door and announcing themselves. Once they were inside, they asked me where I was. I came out of my room and they escorted me outside. They told me to wait on the back porch while they searched the house. It was like a scene straight out of a horror movie. They didn't find anyone and said that it looked like nothing had been taken and that there were no signs of forced entry. My boyfriend came and stayed with me for the rest of that night, but I still couldn't sleep. I kept getting up to check every inch of the house. I placed chairs under the door handles on the front door, back door, and even my bedroom. The next day I informed our landlord what happened, but she refused to come out and change the locks, even when winter break was over. For the rest of the time we stayed there, the locks were never changed. I believe it was our old roommate's boyfriend. I think he had an extra key made for him at some point because he was basically living there. But I don't understand why he didn't do anything to me, and he didn't take anything. If I'm wrong and it was somebody random, I don't know why they wouldn't have done what they intended. What were their intentions? Well, that could have been any number of things. So I live in a dorm on campus at my college. I was back a week early during winter break for Greek recruitment, basically interviewing with and visiting different sororities. And the only people on campus were a few other students doing the same and a skeleton crew. 
They didn't have the cleaning company, dining hall staff, or even our resident assistants around. There were four dorm towers, 12 floors each. I was the only one on my floor, and one of only a few in the entire tower. To get up to the dorm this week, you had to check in with the front desk to get your key activated. If you didn't have a key coded to a specific tower or room, you wouldn't even be able to access the elevator. Now, I was in my room on the second night of the week. I had settled back in and sitting on my futon, back against one of the armrests and facing the door. The rooms were your typical long rectangles, with a window on one end and a door on the other. My bed was lofted above me and a blanket was hanging down. So you essentially couldn't see me from the doorway. I was lying there with my headphones in, scrolling through YouTube videos. When I heard the door opening, Not only was there a distinct sound of the key card going in, like a hotel room door, I also have Christmas ornaments hanging from the ceiling. I knew that the door had opened all the way, because it had hit an ornament, causing it to fall off its hook. I froze in fear. I knew my roommate wasn't back, and neither was my RA, and those are the only two people that would have access to my room. My first thought was that, Whoever this was would realize their mistake and quickly back out, kind of like opening an occupied bathroom stall. But as I sat there, barely breathing, I heard them taking two steps forward and even bumping into my suitcase, which was taking up most of the doorway. I adjusted slightly, moving to reach my phone, causing my futon to squeak. Instantly, the footsteps retreated and the door closed. I was stuck where I was for maybe an hour, until I could finally muster up the courage to get up. There on the ground was the broken ornament, and my suitcase sitting slightly ajar. I texted my roommate and my RA, practically begging them to tell me that they were back, but my roommate was still in London, and my RA confirmed my worst fears, but she also had no idea who would be able to get into my room. Even if the cleaning people or maintenance guys were back, they didn't have permission to go into the dorms, nor any way to get in. She assured me she would let the front desk know, and also suggested it was probably a spring admission student who had gotten the wrong key. I accepted that as an answer. They were confused, heard the futon, and realized they had got the wrong room. It would never happen again if that was it, but I still struggled to sleep that night. I even felt terrified to turn around and look at the door when I woke up the next morning. Night returned, unable to sleep and still very scared. I was once again up late browsing Reddit. This time I had my phone close to me and had taped a piece of string over the door since I no longer had my ornament alarm. I needed to validate that I wasn't going crazy. Once again at 3 a.m., I heard heavy footsteps outside my door. The distinct use of a keycard. And my door opening up. I stayed perfectly still. And I realized I could see a reflection of a silhouette in the microwave's door, which sat against the window facing the doorway. They stood there and nearly filled up the entire doorway the light from the hallway streaming around them into my dark room. I once again found myself frozen, convinced whoever this person was had ill intent. Last night wasn't a mistake. I hit play on a video I had queued up, and as soon as the ad started playing, the figure left, and the door closed behind them, and the footsteps retreated. I told my RA and my roommate about this, as well as the front desk, the next morning. All of them confirmed that no one else had a registered key for my floor in my tower, whether it was another student or employees. I didn't sleep for the rest of that week and kept my suitcase and chair in front of the door, but it never happened again. But even now, months later, that 9x20 room is terrifying to me whenever I'm there alone at night. 
since whoever comes through that door is only a few steps away from my bed and blocks the only way out. This happened 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve, and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I would be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so, and I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest. There are parts of it that are completely unlit, but nothing to fear. I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. Both of us were just driving and talking away. There's a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road is a thick forest. The only thing that we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drove down the hill, crossed the bridge, then back uphill through more forest. It was when the highway begins to flatten out again that it happened. Something sprints across the road. So quickly, I nearly hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turn to my girlfriend. Hey, did you just see that? She confirmed that she had, but couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote. They're a fairly common sight around this area but something fell off about this entire situation. Whatever it was ran out in front of the car, then disappeared into the woods. Coyotes usually don't dart out in front of cars like that. So, for some reason, I decided to check it out. I turned the car around and switch on the high beams to illuminate the forest. I then step out of the car and began walking towards the woods. I don't see anything, but as I drew closer to the tree line, it feels like perhaps I had made a grave mistake. My heart was pounding, and the hairs on the back of my neck were now standing at full attention. I don't see anything unusual in the trees. Then suddenly, the car horn blasts. I hurry back to the car and ask my girlfriend what was going on. She didn't say anything. Instead, she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I look over in that direction, and that's when I saw it. Without a doubt, this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It appeared to be a man, completely naked. His skin was covered in mud and in one of his hands, he was holding a hatchet. He looked back at us, and then he smiled, then waved, just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there. Once we were safely on the road again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was trying to look for the man in the direction that he initially vanished in, he circled around and came out from another spot in the forest beyond the car's headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she spotted him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking toward me, his hatchet raised as if making to strike me. We called the authorities once we safely got back home, but they never found anybody. The officer we spoke to explained his theory. The man was looking to ambush unsuspecting travelers. We all agreed that my girlfriend's quick thinking saved my life that night, as it let my potential murderer know that I wasn't alone out there. I moved back into that area recently, so now I drive on that highway often. 
There hasn't been any naked hatchet man sightings yet, but I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now, especially whenever I'm near Deep Creek. I used to deliver on a paper route when I was 13. It was that sort of old school route where I'd hustle every morning around 6 a.m. with a satchel, dropping off the daily paper to houses. It was a pretty cool gig, simple and pretty much exactly what you'd expect. The one lame part about the job was that it was rain or shine. No matter the weather, even if it was pitch black with a blizzard, the paper was getting delivered. That's probably why they used to hire kids back in the day. It was easier to pressure them to go, and they had to walk that route either way. One day, I was dropping off papers as usual in the morning. It was winter and still dark. These were my favorite shifts because it felt like the whole world hadn't quite turned on yet. It was cool seeing all the homes nice and cozy, maybe a wisp or two of smoke still escaping the chimneys. It's just nostalgic for no reason, maybe because of the holidays. I slogged on through the dark. The few street lights that guided my route cast dim yellow glares into the snow drifts beneath them. I remember it being extra still and ominous. I would periodically stop between houses to catch my breath, but it was really to survey the neighborhood. I still can't put my finger on it, even to this day, but I remember just feeling weird that morning. Something was off, but not anything I was aware of. All I could do was push on through the cold and get the job done. Shortly after passing a house at the end of a cul-de-sac, I heard two loud pops, followed by a third a minute later. I grew up around guns and knew that sound, but I just carried on with my route. I figured it was someone getting their car started and the exhaust backfired or something. I'd seen that happen to my dad's truck before and other cars around town, so I knew it was a possibility. In my 13-year-old brain, it was way more likely than three consecutive gunshots. I waited to say anything to anyone until later on that morning. It's just one of those things you don't want to mention because you don't know the gravity of the situation. When I mentioned what I'd heard, my parents immediately told me that it was all in my head. It probably was just a car backfiring. It did put me at ease, and I just went on with my day. That confirmed what I was so desperate to believe. Later that morning, my neighborhood was full of police and news vans, centered around the house. They were clamoring for neighbors or anyone who'd been around the cul-de-sac that morning. My parents told me to stay inside, but the truth is that I would have never gone to speak to them. Just like when I hesitated to tell my parents, I felt like I was doing something awful when I told them about what I heard. It felt disrespectful, strange, and very ominous. It felt wrong. I didn't know every single neighbor that we had at the time, but if any of them were dead, I wouldn't have the stomach to hear the news. That was a heavy realization too, that the paper boy knew first. Maybe that is why I hesitated. I would be speaking about people I didn't know at all, and it felt very sad to me. You may be able to tell the story gave me a lifetime of very quiet, suffocating PTSD. We got the full story as it was pieced together throughout the week. The man who lived in the house was older, at least older than my dad, and had been a local for a very long time. He had a son who was in the army, and had been away for some time. He went through a deployment of some kind. I don't know the exact military details, but he eventually came home to visit his father. When he arrived back at home, he wasn't alone. He would brought another guy with him, and then proceeded to come out to his father as gay. The other guy was his boyfriend. No one really knew any of the details beyond that, other than how the visit concluded. The dad shot and killed them both that morning, and immediately turned the gun on himself. This is all speculation, but I imagine it was a cold visit for them, even colder with a half foot of snow, burying the house and clogging up the streets. It was probably the morning they were planning on heading back to the base or wherever they lived. The father just couldn't take it. Couldn't leave them like that. It's a tragedy and impacted the entire community, but no one more than me. I didn't deliver another paper for a while. Everyone was pretty understanding as to why even the newspaper editor. The talk of the town, but for me, it was a memory. It's like I was the fourth man in the room when it happened or something. Be good to yourselves out there. I was driving to work during the tail end of a massive snowstorm, or sort of essential, food service, but for a college campus. 
Many of the students who live on campus don't have kitchen in their dorms or many don't even drive. So lots of them wouldn't eat if we didn't open up. This made us travel up through some pretty insane conditions, but those kids wouldn't eat if we didn't show up. Even restaurants near campus closed during a level three snow emergency inside the city. Anyway, the informal policy for work for these situations is just to make an honest effort if you can, but don't risk your life. I'm one of the few there that has a four wheel drive and I have the biggest vehicle, a crew cab truck. So I drive down to campus and then pick up workers who live nearby that wanted to come in. I'm rolling down the highway at a decent clip, only one lane that had been sort of plowed. I'd scoot over to the far left and kicked it into four wheel. Not many cars out. It's still snowing and things are going pretty smooth and I'm feeling good. Never fall for that overconfidence though. That's what brings on the trouble. Once you're confident, get relaxed and after that it's all over. You stop making decisions and start reacting. That's when you forfeit control. I'm doing about 40 miles per hour when I notice a pair of headlights coming up behind me. Faster than they should. It has to be an emergency vehicle, right? I, I couldn't really tell. I signal to move over to the middle lane, just in case they're starting to ease over. The headlights are getting closer, way faster than I'm comfortable with. It's close enough now that I can tell it's a big, lifted SUV. Now my farm truck is pretty big, but I'm not keen on wrecking it. And I certainly don't want to tangle with something that's that big in this weather. I assume it has four wheel drive as well, but what a jackass. There's no reason to be driving this fast on ice and snow. I let off the pedal and start inching to the far right lane. Just about the time he's going to overtake me. Just as we're heading onto a bridge. Something went wrong for the guy. That ice got him and he started fishtailing. I'm ever so gingerly towing the brake trying to slow the best I can without risking the same fate for myself. I know without a doubt in my mind, this driver is a lost cause, maybe even a fatality. I'm trying to create as much distance as possible when he collides with something, crashes in the snow, I have a nasty habit of pulling the cars around them into the mix as well. There's just too many extra factors with all the sliding and the embankments. The SUV loses all traction, spins, and goes sliding over across my lane missing me by inches, windshield facing windshield. It was close enough that we locked eyes for a split second, and I could see the terror in them. Then he spun away from me, into the darkness and off the road. He was exactly what I expected, young, either arrogant or ignorant, to how to drive in the snow. Maybe there was an emergency somewhere, but who knows. We both just crossed the bridge as this happened. He went flying off the highway right where the guardrail ended, sailing into some trees. I saw the branches shake and the snow fall with a whoosh, then nothing but the faint glow of the taillights. Now I had to call this idiot in, and I can't tell you how common it is for some dummy driver to send their car sailing off a roadway, snow or shine, only to never be found. Calling it in is the move, because the person that just crashed might be unconscious and there's no way to get to them. They could wake up later with no memory of where they were, and even if they do remember, Sometimes, the crash can rearrange the contents of a car. Their phone might not be where they left it. Either way, that dumbass not only wrecked driving like an idiot, but almost came inches from taking me with him. I saw a couple of cars behind me slowing down and pulling off, so I called 911 and kept right on to work. My butt cheeks were clenched so tight, I thought I was going to have to get someone to pry me off the truck seat with a crowbar. It's not always the ice and snow that'll get you into trouble. It's the damn idiots you share the roads with, who don't know how to drive safe in it at all. I'm so glad that I don't live in apartments anymore, at least in the city I used to live in. I had a family across the hall from me, and they were okay people, except for their oldest son. He didn't say much, but when he did, he talked in a creepy kind of soft-spoken way like Michael Jackson but more like he was on something. He had offered to help us move my wife's stuff into our apartment when her family showed up with a U-Haul, and her family being trusted people said yes. Now, I was a bit hesitant, but we did need the extra help. We somehow got to talking about a pair of pants that I no longer needed, and he's immediately like, yo, can I have them? Sure, whatever, dude. He stares at the pants like he found lost treasure. It was weird. 
As we're moving stuff, he then asks if there's anything else he can have. Creepy. I told him we'd let him know if something fit him that we don't want. After that, my wife knew firsthand just how weird he was. One time, he randomly knocked on our door and asked if we wanted to buy some candy. Fast forward a few months later, and some unrelated stuff in our apartment was making us uneasy, and we were seriously considering not renewing our lease. I knew it was time to leave when we were woken up at 6 a.m. one morning to hear the police shouting, It's the police! Open up! We have a search warrant! They shout two more times, and then we hear a loud crack, and we saw through the people that they busted down a door. A week later, the family moved out. I hated that they left because other members of the family seemed pretty normal. Unfortunately, a week or two later, we see the older creepy-ass son hanging around our hallway. I had nodded to him on my way out to get the mail, and I then called my wife like, He's still here? What the hell? She says I should strike up a conversation to find out if his family's still here, and then I'm confused even though we saw them taking out furniture. So when I came back to the apartment, I had made eye contact, and I asked how his family's doing. They're good. He responds, Cool, cool. Good to hear. I haven't seen y'all around lately. I thought I saw them moving stuff out. Wait, did y'all move? Yeah, they moved. I ended the conversation soon after, and then went back into my own apartment. If they moved, why the hell is he hanging around our hallway? The only thing I can think of is that maybe the older son was into drugs, which would explain his weird behavior. Then the police caught him buying or selling drugs and busted down his family's place because it's his address. Maybe they didn't take him with them because they didn't want part of any of his lifestyle. It's really the only thing I can make out of it, and we only saw him a couple more times before we moved. We barely landed an opening in an apartment on the other side of the town, which is much safer. Our budget was real tight, but it was well worth it, and I'm so glad that I don't live in that area anymore. Peace, love, and be safe and vigilant out there, everyone. Please. <laughs>